second in the series of videos discussing, as I read, Philip Pettit's The State. I'm back in Pennsylvania. I probably will never write a book or anything <laughs> serious again until I have settled someplace and I'm not driving back and forth every couple of days or few days between states and things. Um, but that's my problem, not yours. I want to, and I, I indicated this in the first video, I want to talk about Pettit's methodology uh, for establishing that the state is defensible, justifiable, or actually I think maybe on his position, always justified no matter how it looks. Really, any state at all. <laughs> uh, um, and I guess, I mean, for one thing, I'm stunned by how let's say traditional the methodology is. Like it's kind of like, let's invent a world. It's, like, it's sort of like the uh, method of Plato's Republic or something, or Moore's Utopia. It's let's pretend. Like so let's tell a Justo story about how the state might get going or re comprehensible reasons that one might want a state. And then in a real quick inference, assert that that's why we have a state or that's how we came to have a state. I don't know, it, it's, I would say Pettit's method is stunningly and obviously incapable of establishing any of the sorts of things that he wants to establish. And so I'm a little surprised. Um, in a way you'd hope that peer review would get some of these things, but you know, all the peer reviewers are screeching status, I guess, you know, or whatever, like, didn't, the peer reviewers at least need to read some Graber, because this is just ridiculous, all right? And also, it's an index of the desperation of statists everywhere, that they would accept something like this as an argument. But it's also like, it's just straight up rehashing a whole bunch of stuff from the last 400 years. Right. I'm sure Pettit's a good guy, so, you know, and, um, yeah, okay. Let's, let's talk about this. Chapter 1 of the state, page 16, or as he, he begins to describe his method. Genealogy, again, this has nothing to do with Nietzschean genealogy. The idea that it does is a complete misapprehension of Nietzsche, among other things. I guess that wouldn't necessarily be bothersome for the argument. Um, modern states come in a variety of forms, developed and underdeveloped, democratic and non-democratic, parliamentary and presidential, appreciate that. But is there a single function, purpose, what function means here? It's proper function in evolutionary theory or something? Hmm. Um, this chapter describes a methodology by which we can explore the question and argues that there is indeed reason, all right, imagine a pre-political world with creatures like us living in a situation broadly like ours where there is a rough balance of power across members. Would a state be robustly likely to arise in such a pre-political world? as the unplanned result of intelligible adjustments to circumstances. If it would, is there an effect it generates that explains its appearance and might deserve, therefore, to count as a function it serves? I'm going to assume that that's just going to be security. This function thing is, all right, it's a distraction. What he needs, distractions, boy. <laughs> okay. Um, the idea behind the thought experiment is that if a state emerges in our counterfactual narrative, and if it really resembles the state as we know it, then this gives us reason to take it as a model of the actual state. And if the state in the counterfactual narrative has an effect that's, okay, um, has, the, has an effect that satisfies the constraint on being a function, the constraints on being a function, then that supports the hypothesis that the state in our world serves a similar function. This at any rate, so long as the balance of power envisaged in the narrative obtains in the actual world, which it does not, but okay, 
It, of course it does not. All right, so first of all, I mean, this is Rousseau. This is Locke. This is Rawls. This is... Imagine people just making up uh, a society. What would they do? What problems would they face? It's a just so story, of course. All right. Um, so I guess what I just read runs like this. If we can tell a fictional story, first of all, our project is to justify the existence of a state. We're looking for any way to do that. Let's just acknowledge that, okay? We're groping for an argument for the legitimacy of state power. And we need one because force and violence and oppression need justification. All right. Uh, so, we're, so we'll tell a fictional story about how such a thing might arise in a justified way. Right. Now, that could be interesting, I guess. It was fun and interesting in Rousseau, you know, and in Hobbes. I mean, it's not clear whether Hobbes really thought this was a historical thing. Not exactly, I think, right? This was a thought experiment for Hobbes to sort of, you know, or, but he thought it engaged something about the origin of civilization. I have no idea whether Pettit thinks that's true in this case. I think he does, actually, I guess. Like, this is part of the story, at least, the historical reality. All right, so if we can tell the story of something, a story about something, about the origins of something, in a way that makes it appear to be justified, that is, gives it a comprehensible function, then we are, then it, 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 it's okay to assert of that fictional story that it is actually the explanation of the historical truth. That is, if you can give a plausible myth of the origins of something, that's a, and, and it looks, you know, and it explains something that looks sort of like what actually happens in this world, that's a reason to think that this story is true, this narrative or genealogy, fictional genealogy is true. That's a crazy position. Like, that's the worst methodology I ever heard. I can't believe you did this without even thinking about criticisms and stuff. Okay? So, like, wait. Let's take the creation myth of Genesis. And then a series of other creation myths from different mythological cycles around the world. All of them explain various features of the actual world. That's what they're for. Okay, why night is different than day, you know, why people do bad things, why we die, okay, um, why the crops grow, why the crops fail, all, that. all these creation myths, which are totally incompatible with each other, all explain certain features of this world. How good a reason is that to regard them as true? So first of all, you, got, you can choose at most one. But you have the same reasons to regard all of them as true. Just as good as your reasons for regarding this as the origin, motivation, function of the state. When you can tell a myth that makes it make sense, that means it probably is true. All right, well, I make that an index of the desperation of, <laughs> of, of uh, the statist argument, you see. Now we'll authorize the flimsiest kind of argument, the most obviously fallacious kind of argument that you can imagine, right? Like, if we can tell a plausible fictional story of how we got something like here, but not here, then that's a good reason to regard that story as true. Oh, golly. I, I don't even know where to start on that, okay? Okay. Uh, how about the fictional narrative of the origins of the United States or something like that, okay? Like the schoolboy chopped down the cherry tree story. It gets you something like something like the United States. It, it blinks all the oppressions and shit, but that's what we're going to be doing. 
pretending this is not oppressive. That's the purpose of this thing. Now, here's a real good, quick application of it. He does it straightforwardly, and he shows himself as clearly as possible that he's not using a defensible method. So what he goes, he, he gives a parallel case, and it is the origin of money. And he gives the most conventional narrative, as he gives the most conventional political fiction, he gives the most fi- conventional money fiction. Well, there were barter economies, people were exchanging, uh, you know, sheaves of wheat for diamonds or something like this, or I don't know, you know. Uh, but barter economies are inconvenient, blah, 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 blah. He runs the whole thing in the most classical, familiar way. Um, this is, you know, starts on page 18 of the state. Um, the genealogy of money. No, this is not a genealogy. <laughs> this is a just so story. Begins with an imaginary barter society. Imaginary is the word, in which people seek to trade with one another for the commodities or services they require. The members of this society will face obvious problems, for no matter how well-resourced someone is, they may have nothing to trade that is wanted by those who can meet their needs, but there is a way out of this difficulty that is likely to materialize, regardless of various contingencies. All right, so we tell the familiar, ultra-familiar just-so story about money. And... When we get to the end of that story, we assert that we have reasons to believe it's true, but they're not empirical reasons. I mean, (laughs) you don't have any reasons to believe that's true. You can't figure out the uh, origin of money without historical research, dude. Really, for real. And... This has been totally smashed. This has been destroyed. And there's something like a consensus on this, even though it comes from anarchist anthropologist David Graeber. But, I mean, many people have attacked this just-so story about the origin of money. Graeber completely ripped it to shreds forever in debt the first 5,000 years. And that just-so story about money is not just a neutral fiction. It is a defense of money, all right? And it's an ideological concealment of the oppressive function of money, which originates in debt, right? Let's, (laughs) you know, Graeber and, and others have just shown that this is completely wrong, okay? And now, if you justified, if you defended the function, the existence of money on the grounds that just this just so story could sort of explain how something like this arises. That's dishonest, but it's crackpot fallacious. There are many, many possible just so stories that get you to something vaguely resembling this world. Um, the, the money just-so story gets you to something vaguely resembling this world, except for the economic exploitation. And the just-so story about the state gets you to something like this world, except that it gives you a completely fictional state that has nothing to do with genocide, taxation, war, you know, all the real practical uh, matters here, you know. Um, and, I mean, he even gets to... I mean, he says something like this, because this is all fictional, this is a note on 22, note 6 of chapter 1 of the state. Thus, the line adopted on the function of the state is not jeopardized by accounts of the historical origins of the state that take a rather different form from the counterfactual genealogy. See Clostris, Scott, Graeber, and Wengro. So, the fact that the states arise through exploitation and oppression, war, is completely irrelevant to this justification, which is that if we can give a fiction 
according to which it would be justified, it is justified. Or if we can give a fiction according to which it would be justified, that's a reason to think it, that, that the fiction is true. Okay, now there are many problems with the whole structure of Pettit's argument. But it can't get going. It can't even start, you know? And the fact that you're going to justify the function of money and the state in a fictional universe that you just made up, no, that does not provide evidence that that's the function of the state in this universe, dude. Not at all. If you want to know what the function of the state is in this universe, do empirical research, man. History is what you need. Political history. Not this just-so-story crap, you know? Um, all right. I guess I'm just going to leave it at that. And I'll, maybe I'll bring... I'm going to finish reading the book. And uh, I'll attack some of the later positions that he takes. But honestly... There's no need to attack the later positions. This is a non-starter in the most direct sense. That is, like, the basic assert methodological assertions are completely and obviously indefensible. All right. Well, have a good day. Have a good summer. <laughs>